I see the mute icons ready to go here. So I'm going to start off my talk with one of my personal favorite quotes of all time. This is a quote from Kurt Vonnegut, who is a fairly well-known author of some very famous satirical books like Cat's Cradle and Slaughterhouse-Five. And he says, if I should ever die, God forbid, let this be my epitaph. The only proof I needed for the existence of God was music. So music has, and sound has been kind of a bit of a theme of the past couple of talks, and I'm going to approach things a little bit differently today and uh, give you all my own perspective on music. So why do I love this quote so much? Well, the, maybe the first question is, why should we need proof of God? So, you know, unity principle number one tells us there is only one power and presence in, in the universe, and God is good. And when we ask ourselves, well, how do we know that God is good? You know, most would probably answer that we know it through our knower, as Terry would say, or we know it through our feeling nature. And we can experience the beauty of God when we meditate, when we silence our minds, when we sink into a wonderful mood out in nature. And it's wonderful to appreciate and experience God in this way. It's, it's the way that is definitely the clearest path towards experiencing and, and knowing God. But I think that to truly appreciate God we don't just want to appreciate it from our feeling perspective or our right brain. It's good to also look at appreciating God from our intellectual, thinking, rational nature as well. And that's kind of the purpose of this talk. I want to take music as an avenue towards appreciating the wonders and the beauty of God from actually a little bit more of a scientific and rational point of view and really allowing not just our feeling nature, but our more analytical and thinking nature to kind of get a taste of God as well. So that's kind of the purpose of this talk. And, you know, as, you know, as, as devotees of our, of our ever present creator, for me, it's like, why not appreciate both avenues? Or as my mom would say, uh, por que no los dos? So that's my goal. Let's, is to give your logical thinking brain some evidence and, and some appreciation for the glory of God. And so we're going to start with uh, a logical argument for, for God that comes from philosophy. In fact, this comes from Plato, who argued that beauty itself is evidence for God. So this is called, in the philosophical world, the argument from, from beauty. He said that there must be some transcendent plane of abstract ideals or universals which are more perfect than the real world examples of those ideas. And, and for Plato, you know, this was before we had a Christian God or an idea of really heaven or anything, but for Plato, like, there was this greater plane that kind of intersected with our own and the beauty that we saw in the world, whether it was music or whether it was art or nature, was kind of proof that there were these perfect wonderful ideals that were kind of you know bleeding into our to our realm and so in my interpretation it's very much like a multi-dimensional approach to looking at reality which as modern philosophers interpret they would interpret that as plato you know referencing a greater power that exists outside of our ability to perceive it directly but we can see signs of it if we pay attention so later philosophers connected this idea of a greater plane to the idea of God. And, and there's many philosophers who actually view this as one of the best arguments from a logical point of view to God's existence. So I'm basically going to use that argument, the argument from beauty, but I'm going to use the context of music to demonstrate why this is such a powerful way to, to use our thinking natures to appreciate God. So this is kind of my claim, right? The existence of music, and not just the existence, but the perfection 
of music as it exists is so beautiful and profound as to be proof of God's existence and his goodness. And some people might say, well, okay, but wait, music was created by humans. So if humans made music, then how can that be proof of God or the goodness of God? It was us that did it. And I would respond, we did not create music. It wasn't us. It was there long before humans ever existed. And I'm going to show you why that is. So we only have time to look at two different proofs of this. And, you know, there's more that, that, that you could certainly argue for. But the two that we're going to look at is uh, music from animals, which were around long with friends evolved. And then we're going to look at a little bit of the science of music, which is a absolutely fascinating realm that you could say predates life itself, right? Because the mathematics and the science of music have been there from the very beginning. And those building blocks demonstrate that, that it, music was just built in to the very foundations of the universe. And it's really fascinating to kind of experience. So let's start with music and animals. And I, I think this is a really fun topic to look at that kind of demonstrates, you know, music is not unique to the human experience. So there's, in fact, a whole study in the scientific world called zoomusicology, which is the study of music in animals or the musical aspects of sound and communication produced by animals. And there's lots of animals which produce song, as I'm sure you guys know. Uh, some include... Uh, toothed whales. If you guys want to look at Neil's screen, he's got a lovely poster behind him showing some, uh, some whales in the background. And uh, what I find fascinating, like humpback whales evolved to sing. They are, they are, in fact, the best singers that exist in the animal kingdom, and I'll tell you why. They have a vocal sac that was evolved in them that recycles the air that they use to produce vocalizations. So believe it or not, humpback whales can sing in the ocean for hours on end without taking a break. And, and in fact, there are recordings of literally five hours of humpback whales communicating back and forth with these beautiful, ethereal, musical sounds. And so, you know, we can, uh, we can argue that the humpback whale is the, uh, is the original singer and frankly even our human uh, counterparts have yet to achieve their their level of singing uh, so you know some other examples are, are you know frogs who also have vocal sacs they have these large sort of globular sacs that they use to uh, produce various rhythmic songs and when we think about music you know a lot of times we think about melody but Rhythm is just as important or maybe even more important in music. And a lot of the songs that we hear from animals, it's not just about the melody, right? So like if you listen to a tree frog or maybe a cicada or crickets or all of that, like the musicality of those animals is not necessarily about the melodies of it, which can often be very varying in pitch. But if you listen to the rhythm of it, there is a clear rhythm to these songs, which is, you know, just fascinating to consider that, that these animals have an inborn sense of rhythm and they know how to repeat phrases, musical phrases over and over again. And, you know, these are animals that once again have existed long before humans. So, of course, everyone's probably favorite example of this are songbirds. So um, I'm going to review a really, really cool uh, book that I found, which was written by this naturalist called F. Schuyler Matthews. And uh, he wrote a book called Field Book of Wild Birds and Their Music. And basically what this guy did is he went out into the woods and he recorded the songs that birds would sing. And then he went home and took weeks and weeks and weeks to transcribe the notes of different birds into sheet music. And I just thought this was absolutely fascinating. So, you know, not only are birds, you know, great singers, but each bird has the distinct melody that you can actually write onto a sheet of music and then play it 
which I just think is so fascinating. And so he's written some, uh, you know, he's written some examples of this, some little pieces of music where he took the, the call of the bird and he wrote it down. And I'm actually going to play some for you real quick, which I think is, is fun to kind of hear the differences. So this is what he wrote down for the whippoorwill. Okay, so it's got this lovely little melody, and this is what it sounds like. So, you know, that's that's the melody of the bird. That's it's almost like its signature, right? Like it, how it how it identifies itself to other birds is through a melody. I mean, how amazing is that, right? And you know, we can add some chords to it and make it sound like a song. pretty cool right i mean birds are really the original composers you know bach and beethoven and all of them were really just following in in their footsteps so uh all right here is the uh the bob white so this is kind of cool right so this this little melody it uses uh, a center um, note and then it goes to the dominant seventh of the scale so this bird is using a mode in musical terms so it's not even singing its its melody in so the, the previous melody was in a regular major key this melody is actually in a major mode if you were to add some chords to this this is what it would sound like it's beautiful right like these birds know what they're doing musically they didn't even have to go to music conservatory or anything to create these wonderful little melodies so i'm going to do one more uh this is the robin and um the robin has another bit of a modal melody going on it goes like this really cool melody so you know I'll add some chords to it to kind of make it a little bit interesting So that's just three examples, right? And this book is just filled with them. I chose these three because, you know, they were my favorite. But it's just amazing to think that, you know, our interpretations of music have become these very technical kind of ideas of what music is. But music as a feeling and as a, you know, an expression of emotion has existed without form or structure in animals for you know, thousands of years before humans even kind of took it on themselves. And I just find that to be just a, an amazing thing to think about, you know, like that human beings, we have such an a, a important connection to music and, you know, it, it gives us emotion. It gives us ways to express ourselves that words just don't really satisfy and ways to feel things that words might not get us to feel. And, it was there before we ever even existed, like just waiting for us to pick up and animals have been using it forever. So uh, I'm going to say one more quote from this book because I just thought this was an amazing quote. He says, uh, he's talking about a bird that has such a complicated song that it's really impossible for him to transcribe the music of this bird. And he says, it sounds like a lazy, drowsy buzz, which one can only likened to a giant musical bumblebee or an old-time hurdy-gurdy. The unobtrusive music of the Scarlet Tanager speaks of summer's 
peace and rest, soft zephyrs blowing over pine trees, and tinkling shallows of woodland brooks. And I just thought that was, you know, a really beautiful statement to show that, like, you know, the emotion of music, you know, we don't just get it from songs made by humans. Like, we can feel those same emotions from, you know, music made by birds. Or, you know, if you guys, one thing I would also recommend some other time is meditate to the music of, of the humpback whales because it's very meditative. I mean, it's it's just these beautiful sliding notes these beautiful sliding notes that just kind of cascade over one another. And you can have this really, really cool and deep meditation to uh, listen to that. So that's something I would recommend. Uh, so we're going to move on to the kind of topic number two here, which is the science of music. So I find the science of music to be this almost overwhelmingly beautiful thing when you actually think about it, because, you know, what's really happening when we hear a sound, you know, sound is just, pressure waves through the air, right? Like that's, that's all it is. It's just molecules in the air moving around and then our ears interpreting that. So a, a good way to think about it is like when we clap, right? So when we clap, what we're, li what we're literally doing with a clap is we're just compressing air together. That's it, right? We're compressing air really, really fast in between our hands and then pushing that air that was in between our hands outward and it creates all this chaos and motion in the air that becomes sound that's all that sound is it's just pressure waves through air that hit our eardrums and so you know you might be thinking okay well so that's what sound is sound is just air pressure moving. but what's a musical note and i think this is really cool so i brought my guitar along to kind of demonstrate some stuff so a musical note is just a wave in the air that is called a standing wave. And, you know, without getting too technical, basically all a standing wave is, is a wave that has two points that don't move and in between something that's moving. So regular noise and sound is just jumbled waves. And a musical note is a wave that instead of just being jumbled, it has a wave in between and points on either end. So what do I mean by that? Well, look at a guitar, right? So in a guitar, the strings on either end are attached, right? So we've got the bottom of the string over here and the top of the string up there. So we have two points on the string that don't move. And then the string, when we pluck it, is moving. That's all a musical note is. That's it. That's what it is. A musical note is just a wave that has the, a middle part that's moving and then two parts that aren't moving. And so basically what happens is when I pluck this string, the wave of the string creates pressures in the air that match what the string looks like. You know, you can almost visualize a, a musical note almost kind of like a jump rope, right? So like if you think about a jump rope, it's moving. It's, you know, if you look at a jump rope from the side, You've got two sides of you know the people that are holding the rope and then the middle is just moving up and down and that's what a musical note looks like so regular sound is just chaos musical note is just this ordered wave and that's all it is so then it's like okay well if that's what a note is then how do we what's the difference between notes and this is what is really fascinating to me so the difference between notes is just how fast that wave is going. So if you think about the jump rope analogy, a low note would be when the jump rope is moving very slowly. And then a high note would be when the jump rope's moving really, really fast. And what I find cool is like you can demonstrate that on a guitar, right? So like when the string's really long, it's low because there's a long string. The longer the string is, the slower the vibration is going to be, right? But then when I shorten the string, all of a sudden the note's higher because there's less space in the string. So now it's moving really fast. And so we, you know, in science we use hertz to describe this. So one hertz is one vibration per second. And, you know, I'm getting to the point of this, don't worry. I know this is kind of some scientific talk, but this it gets cool in just a moment, okay? So now it's like, okay, 
well, what does this mean in terms of music? So basically, notes are different frequencies of standing waves. And then the question is, well, okay, how did we arrive at this scale? Like, how did we just choose the frequencies of notes that we chose? Like, what makes an A an A? Like, who, who chose that? Like, is, it, is there something natural to it? And I think this is kind of funny. Actually, you know, the note A is, was literally just decided by a group of people. So, you know, if you buy a clarinet or a flute in New York or London, the A on it will always be the same, always be the same frequency. And if you ask people, they generally think, well, maybe like Beethoven decided this or Mozart decided it someone centuries ago. But actually, it was decided in London by a committee in 1939 by just a bunch of engineers who were like, okay, we need to decide what A is. And they just decided on the number 440. So an A, or at least an A in terms of, of symphonic A, is 440 vibrations per second. They just decided that's what it's going to be. And so then it's like, okay, well, then what decides what the other notes are? And this is where I think it gets really cool. So all the notes, y you don't have to start with 440. All notes are, are exact differences of frequencies from each other. So let me explain what I mean. We're going to start with, instead of middle A, which is 440, we're going to start with this low A. So this low A is at 110 vibrations per second. That's all it is. 110. So that's, that's, what, an a, that's what this A is. This is called A1. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, if that's A1, then what are the vibrations of the other notes? So to get to a fifth, a fifth is the most pleasant sounding interval. Now, when I say interval, I mean, you know, the, the number of notes in between, right? So when I play a chord, a basic chord, I've got A on the bottom, E in the middle, that's the fifth and A on the top. Now, how does science see that? The A on the bottom is 110 vibrations per second. The A on the top is exactly double the number of vibrations per second. So the A on the bottom is 110. The A on the top is 220. The E in the middle that makes this nice chord is right in between one and two. So it's 1.5. So think about this for a second. What our ears interpret as a chord is just our ears understanding the mathematics of vibrations. That's all it is. For some reason, our ears interpret double the vibration of a note as an octave or the same note. And for some reason, our ears interpret the middle of that, or 1.5 times the original vibration, as a fifth. Because those fractions are nice, they sound nice, which I find just mind-blowing. If you go to a tritone, on the other hand, which sounds really weird, right? Like, like this sounds really nice. That's a fifth, an octave, and a fifth, and an octave. Now I'd play this. That sounds really weird. That's because a tritone, instead of being a really even 1.5 times the original vibration, it's 27 twentieths. So our brain somehow knows that the fraction is not a perf is not a whole fraction. And I just find that amazing. And you can look at it on the guitar too, right? So like, I'm going to play an A here. When I play... A fifth, I'm exactly 1.5 distance wise to the bottom of the string. And then when I play the high A, my finger's exactly in the middle. And so our brain just knows that.
our like our brain hears the musical notes of it being exactly double the frequencies and that's how we hear notes so here's the final piece of this why do we have 12 notes what what is it about 12 notes that makes our scale and to answer that question we kind of have to put everything that i've been talking about together so here's how we arrive at the 12 notes of our scale as i said before the fifth is besides the octave the most pleasant sounding interval because the fifth is 1.5 times the frequency of the bottom note and our brains just know they can just hear the frequency as being pleasant and so what happens if you do a fifth over and over again well let's go ahead and do it so we're going to start with a low a and we're going to go up one fifth which is as i said 1.5 times the frequency so so we're up to e that's a fifth from a now we're going to do another fifth we're on b we're going to do another fifth and we're just going to keep doing fifths all the way up the keyboard another fifth now we're on, on, on up to g another fifth on d and another fifth and we're back to a it takes 12 fifths to go from your original note back to the same note and that's why we have 12 notes in our scale that's the reason so it's literally just because our brain knows the rate the mathematical ratio of frequencies it just knows it somehow like we evolved to hear 1.5 times the frequency of the bass note we evolved to hear that and if we just take that exact interval over and over again it takes us 12 times to get back to the original note and that's why we have 12 notes in our scale and i just find this to be such a beautiful thing because basically it means that our brain can hear the mathematical fraction three over two or 1.5 in such a clear and precise way that all the emotional worlds of beauty and harmony sadness joy love are built from just that ratio of frequencies that ratio of frequencies repeated 12 times and then condensed into a scale and it's to me that's magical but it, it doesn't stop there i mean there's something special about the number 12. like why did it have to be 12 notes why did it have to be 12 times to go from you know the bottom a to the same a like it could have been 10 it could have been 11 it could have been 13 but somehow it was 12. and i think it's because if we look at the mathematics of 12 like there's something special even holy about that number uh you know some if you think about it i mean it's everywhere right there's 12 months in a year clocks work on a cycle of 12 hours if you look at the bible jesus selected 12 apostles because there happened to be 12 tribes in israel in the book of revelations there's 12 gates of heaven and then there's 12 angels in ancient greek times even the greeks were on this same train they had 12 gods in olympus in their original uh, religion and uh you know it's almost christmas time we're getting up to december and you know how many days of christmas are there of course there are 12 days of christmas and you guys might be thinking well okay that's all that's all western stuff so you know what i mean what about other religions what about the eastern religions well if you look at the chinese calendar there are 12 animal signs of the chinese zodiac in the islamic faith there are 12 imams or 12 successors to the prophet muhammad and in fact certain sects of islam are waiting for the 12th prophet to return that's their entire religion is built on that and you know i mean we even have a number a name for the number 12 like we call it a dozen like it has what other number has a special name like that and you know 12 inches in a foot uh there are 12 ribs that cover the human heart which i think is pretty cool there's a total of 24 ribs on each side uh flag of european union has 12 stars and you just i mean you the more you look at it is just 
it's everywhere, right? There's something universal about this number. And somehow in music, we somehow arrive on the same, we arrive in music at the same holy number that we arrive in the Bible, that we arrive when we're doing calendars, when we're looking at, you know, measuring things. And there's something about that just speaks to a beautiful order in the universe. And so when I argue for the existence of God from a perspective of beauty, I don't just mean how beautiful, you know, a major chord sounds or how hauntingly beautiful a minor chord sounds. Those are aspects of beauty to music that can't be denied. But I also mean the beauty of the organization and the structure of music that was divinely there before we even existed and how the mathematics of it fit with all these different things. So, you know, one more thing people might say, well, okay, but what about the scale? Scale is only seven notes or eight notes if you include the top note of the scale. And I think this is kind of cool too. So, you know, most people, most musicians would actually say a scale has eight notes because when you play a scale, you always play the top note. Right, and you know, to make another co kind of cool connection, how many colors can we see? And once again, people might say seven, but the truth is, white is also a color because white is all of the colors being reflected at once. You know, black is the absence of color, so that doesn't count. So there are eight notes in a musical scale, and notes are vibrational frequencies that we're interpreting. Light is also vibrational frequencies that our eyes are interpreting. So we have eight notes in the musical scale, eight colors that our eyes can perceive, and what's the ratio of eight to 12? The ratio of eight to 12 is 1.5, which brings us right back to our fifth, which is the, oh, well, sorry, the ratio of 12 to eight. The ratio of 12 to eight is 1.5, which is the same frequency ratio that we used in our fifth, and that we use to get all the notes of the of the musical scale. So, you know, next time that you're listening to a piece of music, you know, fully experience the music itself and and feel it with your emotions and feel it with your feeling nature and really exist with that piece of music. But when it's over and that moment has passed and you're done listening to the song, you can turn your attention to that left side intellectual side of the brain the rational side of the brain and appreciate the overwhelming beauty and perfection of god from the the point of view of how marvelous it is that we have this incredible world of vibrations that our bodies and our ears which were, were designed to appreciate in this perfectly mathematically ordered way and we somehow evolved to experience these these feelings and in this way i hope that your appreciation of god's beauty and god's goodness can grow to even greater heights amen <laughs>